Good afternoon, everybody, and um, hello, and welcome to today's webinar on managing directors' liabilities in relation to climate change and human rights. Um, I see that uh, participants are still signing in. Perhaps we'll just give everyone another minute. Um, the the sign-ins are coming fast now, so I'll just pause for a second. Let, it, let as many people sign up as possible because we've got a full house, which is great. Fiona can enjoy a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So we're we're still got we still got people signing up. Um, when they when it's like it's a bit like the popcorn going in the microwave when it starts slowing down that's when you know to get it out so <laughs> i'll i'll keep an eye on just how quickly people are signing up and then we can um, get started right so i think um let's perhaps get start started it looks like um it's slowed down a little bit so as I said, welcome everybody um, uh, for on today's webinar. Um, I'm Colleen Teron, I'm the CEO of RDA International and its founder. And I'm absolutely delighted to have both Fiona and Laurie joining me today um, to talk about a topic that I think is going to become far more critical, particularly in the circumstances that we find ourselves today. A little bit about today's format. Um, I am just doing a general introduction before handing over to Fiona and um, after Fiona's presentation, Laurie will follow on and I will do a very short synopsis of the law and, um, and after that um, we will have a question and answer session. So please do use the question and answer chat button so that we can see what's coming through or email me directly if you've got something that you would like to add. So for those of you um, that just very briefly don't know about Audia, we are a specialist sustainability, business and human rights uh, consultancy and with expertise in modern slavery. We work across sectors from small organizations to FTSE 250 and um, we've been trading for about 10 years. I'm absolutely delighted to have Fiona with us today. And um, Fiona, some of you will probably know, you will have seen her on social media and other forums. She's the CEO of the Principles uh, um, for Responsible Investment, which is a UN organization with more than 2,800 signatories of over eight, uh, representing um, over US $90 trillion um, dollars in, in um, and she's appointed in 2013. Fiona has 25 years of experience in financial services. She joined um, the PRI from the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees, where she spent seven years as the CEO. Fiona serves on a load of boards, including the board of the UN Global Compact. She's a member of the International Integrated Reporting Council, the Global Advisory Council on Stranded Assets at Oxford University, the UN Business for Peace Steering Committee, the Committee for Climate Action um, 100. She's also a member of the UK Green Finance Task Force and is on the advisory board for the UK Green Finance Centre. In 2018, Fiona was named one of the 20 most influential people in sustainability at Barron's Magazine. So we're absolutely delighted to have you. Thank you, Fiona, for coming to, to share with us today. So I'm going to hand over to you. I'll stop sharing on my side and, and let you take over. Thanks. Oh, well, um, thanks, Colleen. Hi, everyone. And uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm just going to hopefully, uh, technology is not always my strongest point. So I'm just trying to make sure that I can now share my screen. I'm getting there. Sorry, just give me a sec. Here we go. Right. Now. Hopefully, you can all see that now. Yes? Yep. Colleen? Perfect. Um, uh, Perfect. Uh, I am relying on you that it's all fine. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. A different view if you want to. 
it's in your presenter view, but don't worry if you don't want to, Fiona. There we go. Okay, that's fine. Good. Okay. So um, anyway, thanks for having me, everyone. It's great to be here. And I really hope that you and your families are all safe and well. Um, today, I'm going to touch on ESG as a long-term value driver and really try to talk to you about what investor expectations are of corporates on sustainability, sustainability issues. So Colleen uh, did mention that PRI, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with PRI, but for those that aren't, um, we were formed in 2006 out of the UN system, really to bring sustainability to capital markets. And we've got six principles that our signatories agree to that are all around incorporating ESG factors into their investment process. And we currently have 3,000 signatories who represent 90 trillion in US assets um, under management. So um, the PRI defines responsible investment as a strategy and practice to incorporate environmental, social and governance or ESG factors in the investment decision and active ownership activities. So ESG issues are, of course, becoming increasingly prominent on investors' agendas and, in our view, will only continue to gain importance. Driven by the rise of responsible investment, mega trends such as technological, technological disruption, societal imbalance and climate-related re trends. And boards, of course, um, who take into consideration their their fiduciary duty also need to think about long-term value creation and the role that ESG factors play. So on this slide, you'll find a snapshot of some of the key ESG issues under the E, the S and the G that our signatories consider. And they range from labor relations to executive pay and board governance and climate change. I'm sure they're all issues familiar to you. And obviously for different investors, they have differing priorities. But I would say that climate change and the transition to a, a low carbon economy is one of the key issues that our signatories are considering. Inclu included with that is human capital management and of course board structures and compensation are some of the overarching issues. So coming to the question about why board directors need to consider ESG factors. Well, in short, within your role, you have the ability really to set the direction on these issues within your own company. And these issues to us pose significant risks and opportunities for the entire business. And ensuring that these factors are appropriately considered is an important responsibility that boards have. And investors really want to understand boards thinking on ESG issues, and they want to understand the oversight that is in place within organisations. A key factor here is that investors as shareholders are increasing their stewardship activities on ESG issues, along with their expectations of corporate boards and how they incorporate ESG factors into their business operations. So market demand is growing and it's continuing to grow. In my view, this is an inevitable agenda. It is not going to go backwards. We find this at both the institutional and the retail level from beneficiaries and investors calling for business to consider these issues and show increased transparency. I think very importantly, more than two thirds of our asset owner signatories now routinely ask ESG questions in their request for proposals or RFPs when requesting new business from asset, the asset management community. And they expect the asset, own the asset management community to be able to demonstrate how they go about integrating ESG factors, but importantly, what they do about the stewardship that they have with the companies in their portfolio. Uh, retail demand is, of course, also increasing. And this is really important in a DC orientated uh, world where um, we find that we're finding demand is high, but also more importantly, that 85% of millennials see sustainable investing as more important today than they did five years ago. And I think this figure is very compelling when you consider that a mammoth four trillion of assets will be transferred 
to future generations in the next decade. And finally, of course, there is also higher levels of regulation at both the regional and national level that, that's playing its part in ensuring that ESG issues are considered as part of an investor's duties to clients and beneficiaries alike. The number of investment related regulations globally in the form of pension regulations, stewardship codes and corporate disclosure guidelines now exceeds 500, more than three times its level 10 years ago. In fact, across the world, across the globe, the world's 50 largest economies, the PRI finds in its research that there have been over 730 hard and soft law policy revisions across some 500 policy instruments, which support, encourage or require investors to consider long-term value drivers, including ESG incorporation. Furthermore, undermining, underpinning, I should say, these growth drivers is increasing evidence that ESG integration doesn't equal sacrificing investment performance or business outcomes. Um, not properly considering ESG factors can have some very real repercussions. You all know well the multinational brands show, shown here, BP, Tepco, Volkswagen, Facebook, Tesla, and there could be many, many more up on a, up on a slide, um, each of which have felt the effects of their share price and reputations uh, when they have ignored ESG issues over the past de decade. Now, Tesla is a more recent example, but Facebook, as you know, has faced ongoing issues. Uh, referenced on this slide is the company's largest share price drop, which raised an astonishing 120 billion in market value on one day. And the company, of course, faces ongoing challenges. The New York Times recently noted somewhat ominously that regulators around the world are circling, are circling Facebook. We've seen other recent examples in headlines too. Uh, German online payments firm Wirecard saw its stock plunge last February on reports of accounting misdeeds in its Singapore unit. And late last year, Danske Bank's CEO resigned over a $234 billion money laundering scandal. Prior to COVID-19, our signatories ranked their biggest risk that they faced and the issue that they were most focused on as climate risk. And if we look at the World Economic Forum long-term risk outlook, we can really understand why. Climate change, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, water crises, natural disasters, human-made environmental disasters, all rank in the top 10 issues. So the vast majority of risks that, you know, experts in the world made up of academia, business, investment, government, government departments say that we risk are in the, by and large, environmental risks. Of course, we have COVID-19. We can see there that infectious diseases was also in the top 10 list. We know that infectious diseases will only continue to grow as the climate changes, as we start to move into um, habitat, that is really been the domain of animals. There's more mixing of human, humans and animals. These, we can only expect infectious diseases to grow more rapidly. When it comes to climate change, I just wanted to mention a few areas that are of importance to our signatories, because this is then what they are asking of corporations. So the first tip I wanted to talk about briefly is Climate Action 100 Plus. So Climate Action 100 Plus is the largest ever engagement on any issue between corporates and investors. It involves 450 investors that represent 40 trillion in assets under management. This engagement targets the, the largest 100 emitting companies in the world. And we have three core asks. So first of all, we want to understand the governance arrangements. What is the board thinking about climate change? How do they go about, about it? 
how do they monitor it? Shockingly, some large corporations don't really have a good strategy in place when it comes to climate change. The second is we ask each company to set an emissions reduction target that is in line with the Paris Agreement. And the third is that we ask them to report in line with the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures or TCFD. This has been a very successful engagement that is yielding results. Investors understand that it is better to work in a way that is collaborative and work with each other, that there's power in numbers. That as an individual investor, I might not have a lot of say, but as a coalition of 450 investors making up 450, uh, 40 trillion in assets under management, we have a strong voice. Investors, however, aren't just asking of corporates. We also established with our sister organisation, UNEPFI, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. This involves a number of investors who themselves have committed to get to net zero by 2050 across their entire portfolio. Of course, the only way they can get there is by the investments they make, the investments they decide not to be in and not to make, and by the engagement that they have with corporations. So again, this is driving discussions with corporates on their, uh, their, their ambitions and their plans to align with net zero. We've also been a big proponent of the TCFD. So making sure that the, there are the right disclosures from corporation and from investors. We've been part of the task force. We've fed a lot into its development and we've incorporated the TCFD indicators into our own reporting. So everyone who's a signatory to the PRI must report on an annual basis about their activities. Another issue that we're very focused on is research that we've called the inevitable policy response. And we're trying to make investors and corporations understand that policy changes on climate change are inevitable. They are going to happen. As countries around the world set net zero targets, and if we take the UK, it set a net zero target. It can't get there unless it pulls policy levers. So levers such as the change to electric vehicles, more, bringing in more rules around energy efficiency, coal phase out, carbon pricing, uh, carbon capture and storage. These are all things that will be needed in a transition to a low carbon economy. What we want to see is that there is an orderly transition and a planned transition. If there isn't, if we keep dragging our heels on climate change, we're going to see that there's going to have to be an abrupt transition. That will upset markets, that will upset investors. So it is all better if we move in the right direction together. Just a few things um, on Climate Action 100 plus and on COVID-19. I'd say that amidst, amidst the deluge of COVID-19 commentary, there is the suggestion that climate change will fall off the agenda of governments, business and investors. However, this claim really deeply underestimates the resolve of the global responsible investment community. There are encouraging signs that investors and some businesses will not be derailed from their efforts. I mentioned Climate Action 100 Plus um, and the engagements that we've been having. During this time of lockdown, we have seen Shell come out with a significant announcement that it's going to basically um, trans uh, transform its whole business in line with net zero, and that will include scope three emissions. We've also, we've also seen Total in the last few weeks come out with similar announcements. So climate change is not off the agenda. Large corporations can consider ESG factors, can consider climate change while they are still dealing with COVID-19. Our message is very clearly, we need to deal with the short term, but the long term isn't going away. And we need to keep the long term in mind as well. So for our signatories, when the pandemic first hit, 
we put out some guidance, a bulletin on how investors should respond to COVID-19. Our overarching message was to make sure that we gave companies the space that they needed to put in place their crisis management plan and to know that we were there as major investors to support them. And we also set out a number of, um, a, a number of investor actions to take. So obviously we needed to engage with the companies that are failing in their crisis management. We need to engage where we feel that other harm is being hidden or worsened by the crisis. We've rec we recommended to our signatories that they reprioritise engagement on other topics. We, that, that companies, again, were given the space to deal with crisis management for COVID-19. That we publicly support as the investment community an economy-wide response that is sustainable, green and inclusive that we participate in virtual AGMs. Virtual AGMs aren't necessarily the, a favoured tool of the investment community. They don't necessarily feel that they can still have their say. But we are in the situation we are, so let's support what companies are doing. That we need to be recept receptive to requests for financial support for good, long-term, sustainable companies. And that we need to, very importantly, as I've said earlier, maintain a focus on the long-term. We are long-term investors. COVID-19 will go away one day, but the other issues will still remain. We've also talked to our signatories about making sure that companies have got in place very good human rights practices and are supporting their workforces and that we get good reporting about what's happening with workforces around the world, but also supporting supply chains and suppliers. We've seen too many corporations who have canceled their orders down supply chains that um, had, already been, had already been ordered. This is just putting further pressure on supply chains, but also on, on workers in those supply chains. Laurie's going to talk about human rights, but one of our concerns in the supply chains is about an increase in modern slavery and human trafficking. Last year, I chaired through the UN a task force on the topic and looking at it from a financial services lens. Shockingly, there are 40 million people in the world in some form of modern slavery and human trafficking. 71% of them are women and girls, and it's a $150 billion annual business. Traffickers pr pr prey on those people who are vulnerable. And we are going to see a huge uptick on people vulnerable around the world. So keeping supply chains running, people employed in those supply chains is really important. Also with the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, this Friday we're going to put out a new guide for our signatories that's on questions to ask of companies about ESG issues in the AGM season. It'll focus on business continuity for employers, suppliers and communities, employee health and wellbeing, and keeping an eye on the long term. So hopefully I've just been able to give you a quick overview of some of the issues that um, signature, our signatories are focused on climate being a number one issue, but also COVID-19 oversight being another issue. Our aim is always to work in partnership with business to have a good long-term partnership and to um, make the transition to the world that we want to see, one that is sustainable for everyone. In our view, if, and I think it's very evident as we see COVID-19 play out, if you don't have healthy people and you don't have a healthy planet, you will not have healthy business and you will not have a healthy economy. People, profit and planet all need to come together and one should not come at the expense of the, of the other. So thank you very much for your time and I look forward to questions later.
Thank you, Fiona. That was really insightful. And, um, and if nobody else is going to ask questions, I will. I, I hope we'll have the time to do that. So I'm just going to hand over to Laurie. Um, Dr. Laurie Parsons is a British Academy Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Royal Holloway at the University of London. He's a principal instigator of the project, um, The Disaster Trade, The Hidden Footprint of UK Imports and investment overseas. He was previously a co-investigator of the globally reported project Blood Bricks, um, untold stories of modern slavery and climate change from Cambodia. Laurie Parsons' work examines the contested politics of climate change or on socio-economic inequalities, patterns of work and mobilities. And it, he has been published in leading academic journals and respected international media sources, as well as informing the environment trade policy of companies, governments, and international NGOs. So without further ado, Laurie, can we hand over to you? Thank you. Uh, Laurie, you just have to unmute. Bottom left. It's in the bottom, there we go. How about now, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great, okay, brilliant. <clears throat> okay, um, so thank you so much, um, Colleen, for, uh, for the introduction and for organizing this. I think it's great to have so many people um, coming together to discuss what is uh, a really important um, so over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to take everybody um, quickly through um, some of the issues that I've been dealing with in the course of this, uh, of this project um, and really kind of um, thinking about how commodity chains and supply chains are linked to this idea of trading disaster. And in doing so, I'll be looking really beyond what we normally think of as uh, disasters as such. Uh, to consider the wider, the wider context of disasters, uh, what I'm calling a three-dimensional approach to the nature of disasters, incorporating the human as well as the environmental and kind of climatic broader dimensions. So, um, usually when doing this kind of thing, we would start with a bit more of an overview and a kind of few key stats to situate you in relation to the topic. But I'm going to invert things a little bit today um, by starting off instead um, right in the deep end of, uh, of what we might call the dark side of the global economy here in the brick kilns of Cambodia in Southeast Asia. So this is one of around 500 brick kilns in Cambodia where about 10,000 people um, work. It's an industry which is known for the difficulty of the conditions in which workers um, labour. It's uh, something that has to take place in very high uh, temperatures and as a result of that um, workers suffer a range of health problems from, uh, from headaches, fainting, nosebleeds, um, sudden death of unexplained consequences are unusually high in this industry and, uh, and injuries of uh, catastrophic injuries are also a regular concern for people who work with very dangerous machinery. So because this is such a difficult industry in which to work, of course most people don't want to do it. They tend to do so as a result of having accrued uh, unmanageable debts outside of the factory, usually as a result of their being unable to continue to farm, which is something which is increasingly a problem for smallholder farm farmers in uh, Cambodia, where climate change has made farming increasingly a difficult uh, game to play. And as a result of those debt bonds and the loss of the family farm, what we see in the industry is uh, a situation whereby whole families or nuclear families come to work together, including children. So uh, children make up around 30% of the population of these kilns. They don't all work, but a significant portion do. And in, in addition to that, we have a range of labour rights abuses to accompany that, even in relation to adults themselves. As well as that, um, this is not only uh, a problematic industry from the point of view of labour, but also from, also from the point of view of environment. So as you can see, I hope from this photograph here, uh, this is a, a an environment in which uh, the noxious fumes produced by these uh, by these factories are extremely problematic, both in terms of carbon emissions and and black carbon. 
uh, but also in terms of the local environmental impact. And that has secondary knock-on impact as well, because as these kilns have traditionally uh, burned forest wood, there is increasingly uh, a, a, a lack of available forest wood, um, which of course has its own problems as you diminish the ability of, of the forest as a carbon sink. But then kilns have increasingly turned to what you can see here in this picture, which is the burning waste from the garment supply chain. And this, uh, what you can see here is the, the, the residue of, uh, of garment waste from garment factories, which uh, provide clothing to the West, which is being burnt and produced these kind of fumes, extremely environmentally damaging, damaging for workers and terrible in terms of CO2 and black carbon. So when I present information generally about the Cambodian brick industry, the response is generally largely uh, similar. People think, what can we do about this terrible industry? Can't it be rationalized and brought in, integrated into the global economy? But one of the things that I always want to get across as much as possible um, when speaking about this is that this isn't an industry which is simply uh, divorced and, and removed and in a kind of backwater of the global economy, but one very much integrated into our kind of wider systems of trade. And in order to exemplify this, I'll take one example, which is um, one of the key buildings currently being completed or has just been completed in Phnom Penh, and that is the peak. So this is a case study for us here. This is one of the signature construction projects going on in, in uh, Phnom Penh's waterside um, area now. So um, this is uh, a building which we've tracked back to those very same kilns, so built with those same bricks that we've seen the pictures of the, the kilns that produce uh, in, in those last few slides. But rather than being something which is purely, you know, a Cambodian uh, owned and operated um, uh, a business project. This is in fact something which is very much an international investment. You can see here, as I hope you might be able to see there, the Shangri-La hotel chain. Um, this is a building being built in part for the Shangri-La to take over as a hotel and it's funded by the uh, Singapore-based property holdings company Oxley. This is an international investment as many of these large-scale building projects are. It's also invested in by a range of international actors from Standard Life, JP Morgan, uh, to HSBC and a number of others um, in addition to that. So investment chains are one thing. There are murky ends to, uh, to, to the, the chains of investment in which um, many companies find themselves. And in fact, some of those companies have subsequently divested from their investments in, in, those, uh, in those buildings as a result, in part from our findings. But you would have thought, and indeed many people do think, that supply chains are essentially a cleaner sort of process. Um, that effectively when you're trading goods, you can have uh, so somewhat more control over the, the conditions in which they're made, it's more trackable. Um, and so in order to exemplify this kind of issue in terms of supply chains, I'm taking the, uh, the, the context, the example of the garment industry, which is a surprisingly large one between the UK and Cambodia. Despite the lack of uh, a significant presence of Cambodia in the British public imagination, it's actually one of the places where we get a large proportion of our clothes from. The UK is the second biggest trading partner of Cambodia in the world with mutual trade of around 1.4 billion pounds annually. There are a number of very large British companies involved in trading with Cambodia, including, for instance, Marks and Spencer, who of course, as they do in all of their operations in the global south, have a number of, uh, of key kind of promises in relation to the ethics of their uh, of their of their supply chain. So here's an example here, zero waste to landfill, one of many similar such promises by uh, by various companies that work in Cambodia and other similar countries. But if we just look a little bit beyond the kind of headline promises, we can see the evidence is not difficult to find of these kind of zero waste, uh, waste to landfill promises being far from actually carried out in reality. So this is a photograph of a, of a land, of, of a, in fact, of a brick kiln where uh, offcuts from Marks and Spencer's clothing have been brought from a landfill site to be burned in a brick kiln and there the child's feet in order to exemplify the point. Um, so how then have a company like Marks and Spencer's with all the resources to, you know, rationalize and clean their supply chains ended up in that kind of situation? Well, the reality as we see it is essentially that the way in which we conceptualize supply chains is too simple. So this is what a supply chain looks like to most people. It's essentially a linear process. It moves from one stage to the next, 
we have a limited simple uh, uh, and relatively low number of actors involved at each stage and we can liaise with those actors we can engage with them make sure that those parts of our supply chain are clean but nevertheless if we look more broadly this is still a simplified diagram in reality but the nature of global trade involves so many different actors who are uh, integrated into these systems in indirect ways that the impact of trade actually often has a knock-on effect and kind of a, an, an invisible dimension which we don't tend to recognize in those simplified diagrams of supply chains on which those promises about zero waste and clean supply chains are made. And in order to exemplify this a little bit further, I'm going to take us out of Cambodia now to a, 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 to a different context, starting in the UK and starting with a different material away from garments and into the idea of bricks. So in the UK, we have a proud tradition of brick making and construction. Um, and historically, we've always been able to be self-sufficient in our kind of brick production, our construction material production. So you may be surprised to learn, as I was uh, relatively recently, that the UK is now the world's number one importer of bricks. We import 8% of our total uh, brick stock um, annually. And that's the highest proportion in the world. Some of those come from the EU, others come from much further afield, including, for instance, China, Turkey, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And all of these imports help to plug a gap in global, uh, global uh, sorry, in the UK brick uh, stock of around 2 billion bricks annually. Now these bricks that come from abroad are essentially quite prized for their qualities aesthetically. Often they have a different characteristic, a different appearance to the British bricks that we produce because they use different clays and have even won awards in many cases, these imported bricks. But in many cases, the conditions in which these bricks are made essentially carry an enormous hidden cost. So this is an example, some photographs here, of uh, some of the bit brick kilns of Bangladesh where bricks similar to those we've just seen are produced. So I've highlighted two dimensions of the brick trade here, or the brick production industry in Bangladesh here, um, which are of course particularly relevant to the topic today. So we have, uh, in first instance, the huge carbon footprint of producing bricks in this way. And that's before we even consider the cost of transporting those bricks from, uh, from a country as far afield as, uh, as, as Bangladesh to the UK. Just the transportation alone, before we get into the production of the brick itself, produces for, to build a single house around 50 tons of CO2 when it's transported as they usually are uh, on a cargo ship. Then of course we have the, uh, the human dimension, many of these bricks are produced in, uh, in conditions which don't conform to anything like the kind of system of labour rights that we would recognise in the UK. Bonded labour is endemic in Bangladesh, as in other parts of the brick belt, and yet this tends not to be considered in the supply chain of, uh, of, uh, of many housing, um, housing uh, companies which import bricks in this way. One of the key things that tends to be missed off is that bricks, uh, is that products produced like bricks in, in countries like Bangladesh don't only have a wider carbon footprint and a kind of human footprint, but also a local environmental footprint. If you were wondering where the clay for the brick itself comes from, it isn't from, uh, from a quarry in the way that we do here in the UK, uh, a localized quarry with very clearly defined boundaries, but rather from the local rice fields around brick kilns. Um, with, literally, uh, with literally clods of earth, the topsoil, which was previously until recently used for farming, being harvested out in this way and sent off to the brick kilns for processing into bricks that we here in the UK will use. So essentially what this means then is that every product that we import, whether it's a brick or a piece of clothing, has what we call a three-dimensional environmental footprint. In the first case, it has a carbon cost produced with not only producing it, but also shipping it from whatever place it comes from to our shores. Secondly, there's a local environmental cost where the impacts of, uh, of, of broader processes of climate change are exacerbated by, uh, by the impacts of trade in those local environments. And then third, of course, there is a human cost. The, in, the conditions in which the labor um, producing that good are, uh, are produced and then also the, uh, the conditions 
which more broadly arise from the practice of trade in those local environments. So in order to exemplify this, I'm just going to take you through a couple of examples uh, that we've kind of uh, that we've looked through to reiterate. So thinking about bricks, we have in the first instance that carbon emissions, both in terms of transportation and the production of the brick itself, those very noxious CO2 and black carbon emissions. Secondly, we have the local environmental impact of producing them, which actually worsens the effects of climate change in the areas where we do these practices of trade with. As a result of this kind of digging out of soil on such a huge uh, scale, for example, we uh, find ourselves, or, or people in Bangladesh find themselves presented with a kind of changed topography around their rice fields so that the lack of absorbance of the soil ends up creating floods, exacerbating these kinds of small scale natural disasters, which can be so damaging for everyday lives in the global south. And then we end up with this kind of impact, the human impact, the floods which arise as a result of those linked two scales of, uh, of environmental impacts. Taking the example again of clothing, you can see, uh, of course, there's the, uh, there's the carbon emissions which arise from the factories which produce those, uh, which produce those items of clothing. Then there's the way in which that energy for, the, uh, for, the, for the, the factories is produced. Often this involves large scale deforestation with all of the local environmental impacts that this creates, changing rainfall patterns, changing patterns of agriculture, and ultimately, as it's been linked to in Cambodia, further droughts. So what I'd like to get across then really is that if we broaden our sense of disaster from the general uh, idea of it as essentially these very rare unusual and large scale events towards the, the smaller scale natural disasters which we recognize but don't tend to prioritize in the same way, floods, droughts and smaller scale changes in, uh, in the ability of people to uh, farm, often smaller scale only in a general sense actually really quite large in practice. And we can see that as we import goods, as we import products, we are in many cases in a very real sense exporting those small scale disasters out to the areas with which we trade. And of course we've talked about um, how this happens in relation to housing and how it happens in relation to clothing, but it's a broader problem. I've highlighted some other examples here. Tetley tea produced in Sri Lanka for instance, that industrial farming practice ultimately in the changing climate of Sri Lanka with heavier rains is causing an increasing prevalence of landslides in parts of Sri Lanka and tea plantations, which are often not only environmentally catastrophic, but deadly. Although McDonald's, not a UK company, but a British franchise in some cases, although the British franchise of McDonald's proudly boasts of importing its beef from uh, Britain and Ireland only, it imports its uh, chicken from, uh, from other areas, for instance, Thailand and Brazil, with all of the environmental impacts that that is associated with. And then finally, as a takeaway, fact rice, the humble rice grain, is one of the most carbon intensive grains in the world. It has the same environmental impact as a proportion of the global total as concrete at three and a half percent. So when we import these goods we are in a very real sense locally and globally exporting disaster to the countries and the people with which we trade. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. That was um, really uh, insightful and, um, and I think given us a lot of food for thought. I'm very conscious that um, we only have 15 minutes left. I wonder, Laurie, can you stop sharing your screen and I will um, put my side up. I think what I'm going to do is literally just um, pick on a few of my slides and just to allow for some questions um, to come through for five minutes at the end. Um, Sorry, you just need to do shop, stop, share. On, um, can you see what that's at the, at the bottom? So, have you, okay, well done. <laughs> and I'll start, I'll just share mine again. Thank you. <clears throat> so just, um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, oh. Or panelists, okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Don't know why my video is gone. 
Um, right, so I just very, very briefly then want to, um, I'm just going to pick up on, on a few things because we've, I, I think I've got, I've got about 10 minutes to talk about um, what I wanted to cover just from a regulation perspective. Um, so um, when we go back to looking at this, you know, from a, the perspective of what boards and directors should be concerned about, I mean, it's been quite obvious that what we've seen from both Fiona and Laurie's um, discussions is that this landscape of managing a business responsibly has completely changed. Um, and we, we've touched on COVID. I'm not going to speak about that in any detail now. Um, but what I did want to just pick up on was, again, the point Fiona did, did allude to this, but the level of um, change in um, the growth of legislation around climate change, an estimated 1,600 different laws and policies that have been um, developed, but also increasingly the rise in climate change litigation. And obviously, if you are a company director or, or, or managing um, a corporation, these are the kind of things that um, should give you uh, some reason for a concern. And what we're seeing with the climate change lawsuits is they are typically seen as a tool to influence policy and corporate behavior. And they will allege that company shares prices have suffered. And in line, of course, with the developments of climate change legislation, we're seeing this tremendous growth in both voluntary frameworks, but also in legislation governing human rights and modern slavery, typically asking um, corporations to report on how they manage their impacts and um, what frameworks they are relying on. And I think um, one particular um, area to highlight is the issue of mandatory due diligence. And the European Coalition for Corporate Justice has referred to mandatory human rights due diligence as an issue whose time has come. And we're seeing this growing momentum worldwide to require companies to undertake human rights and environmental due diligence, uh, due diligence and to um, hold companies accountable for their negative impacts, which um, actually looking at Laurie's um, presentation particularly is, is that there seems to be such an enormous gap still perhaps between reporting and what is happening on the ground. Now, the European Commissioner for Justice in April, just, just a few weeks ago, um, has announced that the European Commission is going to be developing mandatory due diligence for to cover both environment and human rights issues in 2021. And so we see these trends in due diligence, mandatory due diligence um, growing. The French vigilance law is a good example where it covers both environmental and human rights legislation. The EU non-financial reporting directive is another good example, although it's currently under review. So any of you listening, um, have a look out. The consultation, I believe, is still open for any comments on the reporting requirements. Um, and interestingly, the Australian Modern Slavery Act has made reporting uh, mandatory, which is in contrast to our Modern Slavery Act about the steps that companies should be taking to address um, issues on, on modern slavery and human trafficking. Now, d company directors, particularly in the UK, um, should also be aware of the changes to governance requirements. And I think one particular change that I wanted to highlight was the introduction of a so-called Section 172 of the Companies Act, requiring directors to report on how they're fulfilling their duty to promote the success of the company um, for the benefit of its members as, as a whole. And in doing so, to have regard to other matters such as stakeholder considerations and interests of its employees and the impact on companies. Now, um, oh, you've... What should this mean for directors? What are, they, what are their duties in compass and how will this give rise to potential liabilities? Now we know that um, directors' duties are encompassed in a number of legislation, not just reporting requirements under the Companies Act or the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, but also encompassed in a, a legal or statutory duty of care. There are also duties applicable to certain categories. So um, pension funds as part of the fiduciary duty should also have regard to um, the environmental impacts that companies have. Um, and directors, 
besides having to report accurately, need to also be cognizant of the fact that they have to ensure that companies are legally compliant. So meeting the requirements of the law, both at um, uh, domestic, well, in, within domestic juris jurisdictions, and um, in some instances, ensuring that they um, actually apply international labor or international um, uh, requirements uh, and norms into, into the way that they behave. We are also seeing a lot of discussion arising, a lot of commentary around um, directors' fiduciary duties. Now, fiduciary duty um, encompasses a relationship of trust. It promotes... Um, under the fiduciary duty, directors have to promote a company's best interest with reasonable care and skill and due diligence, and they have to exercise um, independent judgment. Now, this is particularly relevant looking at the kind of cases that are beginning to come through where um, there are questions about um, liability arising from uh, directors failing to actually adhere to their or um, embody their fiduciary duties and also um, those that are not fulfilling their statutory duties. And how do they incur liability? So there's a range of liabilities that um, a director can um, find themselves in the firing line for, under, either under civil liability or in, for for criminal offences like a failure to report or ensuring that, for example, their strategic report complies with the Companies Act. In some instances, there is environmental legislation that will hold directors personally liable um, under, for example, some of the waste legislation that we see in the UK. Um, there is potential liability under other provisions under the Bribery Act, the Financial Services Act, and um, the remedies for breach of fiduciary duties are typically in damages or an in injunction. So what we are seeing is this picture that directors who are um, who are making decisions in the interests of the companies, they are potentially can find themselves liable for issues arriving out of climate change and human rights legislation um, in a number of various ways. And we are seeing an increase in case law where this where they are coming under spotlight and where this is being tested to see where um, directors might find themselves personally liable. Some of the examples that I've pulled out from recent cases of directors' failings, maybe because they've acted dishonestly, because a company has benefited from profits, making use of um, forced labor in the supply chain. Might be that they are failing to monitor and manage climate change risk and disclose these to shareholders. They may fail to act in good faith or in the company's interests as a whole, not perhaps providing enough resource to tackle supply chains. Failing to ensure public disclosures are underpinned by robust procedures and perhaps um, failing or approving a strategic report knowing that the facts in it are actually non-compliant. Um, I'm cantering through, sorry, <laughs> just want to give everyone a chance to perhaps um, have some questions at the end. Um, I think that uh, the DJ Houghton case, um, this one is particularly interesting about um, the directors being found personally liable for um, serious contractual and statutory duties. This relates particularly to the exploitation of workers under um, um, in, 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 in circumstances which were regarded as modern slavery. We have a, a summary of this particular case on our website. So if you want to find out more about it, just um, have a look and download it. The other aspect that um, directors should be concerned about in relation to how they manage their own risk is this increase in shareholder resolutions <laughs> that we are seeing. So up by 40%, we're seeing that um, some of the shareholder resolutions are actually leading to lawsuits like um, in a case involving Exxon recently, and for the first time in the last two years, we started seeing companies facing resolutions around human rights. So um, this has been um, picked up in Australia. So Fiona might already be aware of these um, around Qantas and Woolworths and Origin in, in Australia. And one of the things I just um, wanted to mention, and, and I really am cantering through this, is that 
managing risk is particularly or it is particularly in director's interest to start moving away from a silo mentality. And we see this particularly in um, working with businesses um, in, in, in all the different sectors is that silo mentality around environment and social governance issues still exists. And often I see um, in different businesses I've worked with very strong departments, um, working on CSR or the environmental issues and then separate departments dealing with human rights, labor, supply chains. And we need to actually see better integration because the integration will mean that you start streamlining processes, but that also you are able to um, understand risk in a different way. I think Laurie's presentation um, you know, really highlighted that, the um, fact that we have reporting about some issues, but on the ground we see different issues on the environment. And of course, Fiona, you also spoke about this integration on environmental, social and governance issues. So managing risk more effectively means actually um, breaking down these silos. And, and actually, I wanted to mention that from a compliance point of view as well. We, we, I wrote a guide for IEMA a year ago on uh, managing compliance around environmental and human rights laws. And in the workshops that we did leading up to that publication across the UK, we um, had a number of um, conversations with stakeholders and it was really clear that actually managing compliance in an integrated way around human rights and climate change was also um, a challenge. And um, I'm sure that we'll see the whole this integration catching up as we see the emphasis coming on ESG and we and and particularly as COVID-19 has highlighted the vulnerability um, for business on both its environmental and its um, human rights issues particularly in supply chains um, and so what should um, directors be thinking about I think you know primarily we still need to see policy commitments to legal compliance and driving um, ESG performance. We need to see a greater understanding of the and of legal compliance. Um, I, I say that because I think that um, there is still a real challenge around businesses with complex supply chains requiring or in their codes of conduct stating that um, they will adhere to the law, but actually not even being aware of what the law is in certain domestic um, legislation or just domestic areas. Uh, jurisdictions. Routine evaluation of that compliance, but particularly having staff awareness, competency, training that needs to be done, um, rising, raising awareness on across the ESG agenda, um, monitoring, audits, reviews, communication and delivery of improvements. Um, there are, and I'm sure there's a lot more that we could discuss in this area and I am sorry I have absolutely cantered through this but I did want to um, stop just a few minutes before we end to give people an opportunity to ask some questions um, and I see that some of them have come through now um, so I let me just have a quick look um, Fiona there's a question for you um, have you actually responded to it already? It's from Tenny Ekundera. Have you seen that, Fiona? It says, how swiftly have you reached out to companies through the crisis? Is there conflict between giving companies space to manage their way through this crisis and ensuring they are engaging with companies who are failing in this duty? Um, I would love to hear success stories if possible. Um, how are you finding? Okay, there's some other questions in that, but perhaps if you just want yeah. to... So, yeah, very quickly. Thank you for the question. So, um, I think you're completely right. We, we need to not have a conflict between those two issues. So, our advice is very much um, leave companies to have the space that they need to, re to respond to the crisis. But if you do not feel that they've got a good crisis management a plan in place or that they're trying to hide things within COVID-19 so they can't respond to things then you are absolutely must be uh, engaging with them and particularly if you if you think that they're failing in their duties so um, there's obviously a lot happening at the moment because in different parts of the world the AGM, AGM season is um, underway so if I use an example there's a lot of engagement going on at the moment with Amazon um, Amazon, you know, for many people has been quite critical during this this time and Amazon uh, is, you know, making a lot more money. 
but still in different parts of the world it has some terrible treatment of its staff and there it, depending in which country there's a lot of problems with um, staff safety social distancing uh, staff having access to sick leave all of those paid sick leave all of those kinds of things so that's an engagement that's happening at the moment there's a lot of frustration though in the us you have, don't have um, a separation between ceo and chair so you've got um, the CEO who's also the chair, how is, he, how is he running the operations and looking at the governance? From the director point of view, we're not seeing any of the directors, but we can't engage with the directors. It's all going through the CEO. There's no board member who's, who's coming out. So we've got uh, uh, an, an actually a meeting with investors tomorrow to discuss this, where investors are coming together to discuss this issue ahead of the AGM on the 27th. So we are looking at the companies that we don't feel are doing um, doing well on this on this issue. I've got to say though that there's a lot of companies who I think investors are finding are, are doing some good things. And I, you know, I use the example of Shell and Total, who have been responding extremely well, not just to COVID nineteen, but still to their engagements on climate and other ESG issues. Thanks, Fiona. That's really helpful. I mean, interesting there about not seeing directors involved in this. I mean, I think we we seeing that, you know, there needs to still be a lot of training and awareness around this issue. Um, and I will just mention that we are, Audia is running a specific training on directors liability out of these issues following on this website. So um, you can look at that on, on our website. We have, I think if I can take just one more question, it says, in the new world, how can stakeholders effectively ensure all aspects of the 3D environmental footprint is considered by business sponsors and a C-suite. Uh, Laurie, do you want to perhaps pick up on that and I can comment? And, and Fiona too, and then we'll pull it to a close. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just um, reading the question and I'm not really sure how to answer it, I've got to say. Oh no, sorry, was the, uh, the one Laurie was trying to answer. There oh, sorry. Go. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> that three-dimensional environmental impact first of all we just need to make sure that companies and company directors are aware that this, this is a uh, this is a linked kind of impact and really to get away from the kind of uh, Laurie Laurie we can't hear you can you put up your um just make it louder can you What have I done? Oops. Can you hear me at all? It says it's new. Hello? We're struggling to hear you. Oh, okay. Um, and I think, do you want to just try one more time and then I'm yeah, just going to stop this one? Yeah, it says it's um, but I'm, oh, it says it's picking me up. It should be picking me up. The microphone's not working. That's all right, we can vaguely hear you. Do you want to just comment and, and okay. I'm just conscious of the time? Yeah, no, I just, uh, just really briefly that people need to be aware of how these different impacts are linked in the first instance. And secondly, as you've said, to avoid um, siloing the issues in particular. Um, and I think there also needs to be a change in focus away from the idea of assuming that your supply chain is, is clean and kind of trying to present this completely clean supply chain towards one that assumes that your supply chain will always have impacts on people, local and broader environment, and to make the incentive a question of discovering more about how that happens. Essentially, we want supply chains to be about discovering the impacts more and more every year, rather than saying this is clean and we'll keep it clean, because trade always has an impact on the environment and people. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Um, Fiona, did you want to just say anything and 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 then I'll draw to a close. I'll comment. No, I, no, I think Laurie's covered it all. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's it's about awareness, and I think also you know it's shareholders are going to push this as well. 
Um, so I'm going to draw to close because I am noticed the time. We're five minutes over. Thank you so much to everybody that attended and stayed on today. Thank you to Fiona and Laurie for your time. Very interesting. We will send out a recording. So if some people have requested a copy of the slide, so get in touch if you'd like some. And um, I wish you all well and stay safe. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.